Today's video is brought to you by our friends over at Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is where you must go to build a website. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. Silk, spices, precious metal, and rugs, but also gunpowder, slaves, and deadly infections. To say nothing of the Buddhist tenets, Christian teachings, and technological innovations. The best and the worst that Europe, North Africa, and Asia could offer traveled across vast expanses of sand, steppes, and mountain ranges, interconnecting distant lands, bringing about the rise and fall of empires and civilizations. Welcome to Geographics and today's destination, the Silk Road. Narrating the story of the Silk Road is almost equivalent to covering more than 15 centuries of Eurasian history, so you'll have to forgive us if we take some shortcuts. And you too may not be bothered to saddle your camel, travel thousands of miles with 500 pounds of silk, and then leave the parcel with your neighbor. So here's a quick overview. The terms Silk Road or Silk Routes were first introduced by German geographer Ferdinand von Richthofen in 1877. The name may ring a bell. His nephew Manfred was better better known as World War I flying ace, the Red Baron. The road, roads, or routes were a network of paths, tracks, and sea routes which linked China to Central Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and North Africa. Merchants traveled in both directions, carrying all sorts of useful commodities and luxury goods, disseminating along the way new religious tenets, philosophical ideas, and technological innovation. The Silk Road on land extended for approximately 6,437 kilometers, 4,000 miles, traveling some of the world's most impervious terrains, such as the Gobi Desert and the Pamir Mountains. One of the most used itineraries started in Chang'an, modern-day Xi'an, northwest China. From there, the track followed the Great Wall, crossed the Taklamakan Desert, also in northwest China, and reached Afghanistan via the Pamir Range. Then it reached the Levant, and from there, bifurcated towards North Africa to the south, or Anatolia to the north, continuing into Europe. The journey was understandably risky, as merchants were prime targets for bandits. That's why traders traveled in large caravans of camels or other pack animals before resting at one of the many trading posts where they could hand over their goods to a middleman. So with the basics covered, I hope you'll follow us into the next leg of the journey, how the Silk Road was first established. The origin story of the Silk Road begins in the 2nd century BC with a man called Zhan Chiang. But before we get to him, there's a prequel taking place two centuries earlier. By 339 BC, the steamroller from Macedonia, Alexander the Great, was taking care of the Achaemenid or First Persian Empire. During his campaigns, he founded the city of Alexandria Ashata in the Fagana Valley, modern day Tajikistan. The city was inhabited by Alexander's wounded veterans who intermarried with the local population. To oversimplify, their descendants created the Greco Bactrian culture, which borrowed from Central Asian, Greek, and Macedonian traditions. And one of these customs was the breeding of splendid war horses. Now we're going to merrily jump ahead some 200 years and shift our attention eastward. In the year 138 BC, the Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty of China was facing the threat of the nomadic Zhongnu tribes, pushing at his northern and western borders. The Emperor sent his envoy, Zhan Chiang, to the west, seeking an alliance with the Yuji. The Xiongnu had defeated these nomadic peoples, pushing them into Bactria, modern-day northern Afghanistan. During his mission, Zhan Qiang got in contact with the Greco-Bactrians, whom he called Dai Wan. The emissary was impressed by their horses and formulated a plan, importing those wonderful mounts to equip the Han army. Emperor Wu agreed, and thanks to the Fagana Valley horses, he defeated the Xiongnu invaders. But the most important consequence was that along the way, Zhan Qiang Chiang had established a permanent route of communication with Central Asia, trading more than just horses. This was the first branch of what would become the Silk Roads. In the following decades, commerce boomed and the Han cavalry became formidable thanks to the Fagana horses. As a result, Han China grew stronger and expanded until it entered into conflict with the Daiwan, who now refused to sell any more of their horses. 
Bahan's cool-headed response to their favorite suppliers was to launch a three-year military campaign. This became known as the War of the Heavenly Horses, which ended in 101 BC with the Han taking over the Fergana Valley. Han China now projected itself into Central Asia, guaranteeing security and stability to the traders traveling along the first leg of the Silk Road. On the other side of Central Asia, the hegemonic power was the Parthian Empire. Two stable nations held military control over much of Asia, which was a blessing for anyone in business. Bandits and raiders were kept at bay, whilst entrepreneurs, merchants, and caravan drivers were marred by less taxation and custom controls. This is when the Silk Road really blossomed, or I should say roads plural, as traders followed a myriad of side tracks and paths. Eventually, this network of roads crossed into the Han capital, Chang'an, modern-day Xi'an, with another great imperial city in the West, Rome. All right, so we'll get back to our video in just a mo. But first, here's a word from today's video sponsor, Squarespace. You know what's great about the summer? Vacation, time off, a little bit of rest and relaxation. It's the perfect time to spend at the beach, daydreaming of the next project you'll want to start. Or maybe that's just me. I do that all the time. Fortunately, Squarespace gives you every possible tool you might want to fashion that next project into reality. Whether it's a small business, a sports blog, a creative portfolio, or just a page of dank memes, whatever, it doesn't matter. If you can dream it, you can build it with Squarespace. Are you looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like? Well, use one of their quick, beautiful templates to make a website that's fresh and for you. Or maybe you're more of a hands-on person, you've got lots of opinions and ideas about what exactly it should look like. Well, don't worry, Squarespace has tons of customization options. And once you're done setting up your website, there are tons of extra features that Squarespace give you so that your site can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support, really everything you need is in one place. So when you're ready to get started on our next project of yours, whether it's big or small, if it involves a website, you have to do it with Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com slash geographics to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now let's get back into it. The preferred method of transportation along the Silk Road was the good old reliable camel. These animals could withstand the harsh climates of Central Asia and carry up to 500 pounds of goods on their backs. Their stamina was legendary, but it was rare for the same camel to cover the entire distance from China to the Mediterranean. It was more common for caravans to halt at one of the many trading posts or caravan sarays. Here merchants and their laborers could take a rest and swap their mounts with fresh animals before resuming their land odyssey. Otherwise, they could sell their goods to another merchant who would take care of transporting the cargo to the next Sarai, and so on. Just think of the markup on that. An alternative to the Silk Road on land was the Silk Routes by sea. Traders departing from Han China may have decided to travel southwards, cross the Himalayan passes, and reach the Gulf of Bengal. Once there, they could entrust their goods to experienced sailors. Exploiting the seasonal monsoon winds, they could sail across the Indian Ocean, reaching Arabia and Egypt in a relatively short time. And so, caravans and fleets crisscrossed mountain ranges, deserts, steppes, and oceans, shifting all kinds of merchandise east to west west to east. Exotic fruits, honey, spices, glassware, rugs, weapons, gems, and precious metals, but also porcelain, ivory, rice, paper, medicinal products, and perfumes. Even living creatures traveled thousands of miles in the name of commerce, horses, camels, pet dogs, and exotic birds. And because the world is not a nice place, slaves were also shipped along the routes, mainly from west to east. But one of the most popular goods traveling from east to west was, of course, silk. By the time of Octavian Augustus, this was the most sought-after luxury in the Roman Empire. But the emperor was not a big fan of this refined cloth, which he associated with the immoral, decadent lifestyle of his enemies, Cleopatra and Mark Antony. In 14 AD, the imperial senate even made it illegal for men to wear silk. So why this hostility against silk? Well, the fact is that silk was incredibly expensive, and Chinese exporters kept the production methods secret. So importers had to find ways to make their supplies last longer. One of these ways was to unravel and reweave the fabric into thinner garments. In fact, they were so thin that they became transparent. In the words of Seneca, wretched flocks of maids labor so that the adultery 
adulteress may be visible through her thin dress, so that her husband has no more acquaintance than any outsider or foreigner with his wife's body. The same culture which staged mass violence as entertainment had an issue with revealing attires. Go figure. But Seneca's words fell on deaf ears, and the influx of silk never waned. The Romans returned the favor by exporting to China carpets, jewels, amber, and metals. Towards the end of the second century, the Silk Road may have brought to Rome a somewhat less desirable importer, deadly outbreak of smallpox or measles. Later known as the Antonine Plague, it may have first appeared in China, but traveled to Mesopotamia via the trade routes. There, Roman legions may have been infected while on campaign, subsequently spreading the plague to all corners of the empire, resulting in the death of 10% of its citizens. The pandemic is not only a tragedy, but also a devastating blow for business and the economy, which flourished around the Silk Road would receive further blows in the 5th and 6th century AD. First came the progressive decline of the Western Roman Empire, culminating in 476 AD. Political instability led to a decline in purchasing power and in the demand for luxury goods. The price of silk nonetheless continued to increase in the following century, fueled by demand from the Eastern Roman Empire. The trend continued until Byzantine Emperor Justinian dispatched two spies to China disguised as monks. The two agents returned with a box of stolen silkworms, which kicked off the local Byzantine silk industry. The scheme impacted silk imports, but other goods continued to travel undisturbed. But then, in 541 AD, another pandemic struck Europe and the Mediterranean region. This was an outbreak of bubonic plague, which killed up to 25% of the population in affected areas. Today known as the Justinian Plague, it reached Constantinople by way of, of course you guessed it, the Silk Road. Based on what I just told you, you may think that the Silk Road was a mere conduit for controversial luxuries, the slave trade, and deadly diseases. But the commercial route facilitated the exchange of ideas, art, philosophy, and ultimately economical, technological, and cultural developments. A fascinating consequence of commercial exchange was how caravan leaders, laborers, and merchants carried religious ideas, thus contributing to the spread of new faiths and to syncretism. It was thanks to the road that Buddhism spread from India, reaching China. China to the east or Afghanistan to the west. The presence of Buddhism in these lands was celebrated by the carving of the monumental Great Buddha's Bamiyan, sadly destroyed in 2001 by the Taliban. Some theologians believe that Buddhist scholars may have even influenced early Christianity, and especially the ascetic practices of some of its mystics like St. Simeon Stylites, who lived 37 years atop a pillar. After Christianity had become the official religion of the Roman Empire, it returned the favor. Preachers and missionaries tagged along with caravans, disseminating their creed in all of Asia, blending with the local traditions. Today in Kyrgyzstan, one can find a Christian gravestone bearing a syncretic symbol across atop a lotus flower. The inscription mentions that Jeremiah the Believer died in the year of the sheep, referencing the Chinese zodiac. Jeremiah belonged to a branch of Christianity called Nestorianism, which held that Jesus was composed of two distinct natures, a human and a divine nature. For this reason, it had been branded as heretic by the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD. Unwanted in the Roman Empire, Nestorians traveled eastward in the following centuries, establishing centers in Tibet and in Chang'an. The Nestorian community settled there in 631 AD, and their presence was commemorated 150 years later by the nine-foot-tall Nestorian stele. The inscription on the monument describes Jesus Christ using Buddhist concepts. Christ fixed the extent of the eight boundaries, thus completing the truth and freeing it from dross, he opens the gate of the three constant principles, impermanence, suffering, and non-self, introducing life and destroying death. At that time, China was under the Tang Dynasty, which had fully embraced Buddhism. Taking advantage of the Silk Road's Tang Buddhist scholars now traveled again to the East, deepening their religious studies in India. One of them, Zhuan Zhuang, recorded all the different variations of Buddhism, collecting more than 600 scriptures during his long trek. When he returned to Chang'an, he housed them in the Great Goose Pagoda, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Zhuan Zhang's travels were dramatized in The Journey to the West, a classic of Chinese literature which inspired, among other works, Dragon Ball Z. I'll leave it to you to decide whether we must thank or blame the Silk Road for that one.
The Silk Road had gone through a period of relative decline caused by turmoil and disease in the West, but it was about to enter its most prosperous period when China came under the dominance of the Tang Dynasty from 618 to 907 AD. These new rulers brought about an era of expansion and stability, projecting their power well beyond the boundaries of their predecessors. The capital, Chang'an, serving as a starting point of the route, became one of the largest and most cosmopolitan cities of its time. By the mid-8th century, its population had reached 2 million with 5,000 foreigners residing in its walls. As described by authors Lawrence Sickman and Alexander Soper, there were priests from India, officials and merchants from Persia and the kingdoms of Central Asia, Turks, Arabs, and traders from Mesopotamia. They grew up side by side, the Buddhist and Taoist temples, Mohammedan mosques, Manchian and Nestorian churches. Caravans traveling out of Chang'an flooded market towns throughout the Near and Middle East with Tang exports, returning with exotic gifts for the imperial court. It was during the Tang rule that the Islamic expansion into the Mediterranean and Central Asia took place, with Muslim traders of Arab and Turkic descent taking on the role of middlemen connecting East to West. The Tang revival of the trade network waned in the early 10th century, when China entered the period of the Five Dynasties. The resulting internal instability and military weakness made it a dangerous affair to trade along the Silk Road, as caravans risked being plundered by bandits or one of the many new polities that had sprung up in Central Asia. One of the parties threatening the tracks in the Far East, however, would later grow in power and would return the road to its past glories. We're of course talking about the Mongols, who under their first emperor Genghis Khan took a campaign of conquest and terror that swept across most of Asia, reaching Eastern Europe. After the death of Genghis in 1227, there followed a period of stability, the Pax Mongolica, in which almost the entirety of the Silk Road fell under the control of a single entity. Safety from bandits and less taxation revived trade once again in a pattern that we've already encountered. But the Mongols did more than that. They improved infrastructure and communication along the Silk Road by creating an efficient postal relay system, and through religious freedom, they encouraged once again the exchange of new ideas and philosophies. It was thanks to the Pax Mongolica that travelers like Marco Polo and Ibn Battuta were able to journey from their homelands in Italy and Morocco to China, returning with wondrous tales of cities and cultures that not even the wildest imagination could fathom. But as we learned already, free commerce and global trade routes might be a force for good, contributing to a more equal distribution of culture and wealth, but they can also play their role in disseminating death and destruction. During this period, Europe started to find out about a Chinese invention thus far unheard of – gunpowder, an import that would change the face of war and conquest forever. The Silk Road would also help to spread across Asia, Europe, and Africa a very much undesired commodity, a devastating pandemic of bubonic and pneumonic plague, much worse than the Justinian outbreak. Originating amongst the rodent populations in Central Asia, the disease caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis hopped species, attacking rats, camels, and eventually humans. The first mass deaths were recorded in China in the 1330s. Then the pandemic, later known as the Black Death, swept westward, carried by the Mongol cavalry and by caravans along the Silk Road. The network of caravanserais, as I mentioned earlier, contributed to the contagion, as infected animals were sometimes housed alongside people, unsuspecting victims who then carried Yersinia pestis in their journeys. A large outbreak was later recorded in 1344 amongst a Mongol army besieging the Genoese outpost of Kaffa on the Black Sea. The besiegers took to catapulting their own dead inside the city walls, crippling the defenders with this novel biological weapon. When the Genoese eventually abandoned Kaffa via ship, the Black Death spread its wings across Europe and North Africa, killing up to 50% of the population. Weakened by the Black Plague and internecine conflict, the Mongol dominion fractured into several competing entities. Meanwhile, in China, the Yuan dynasty founded by the descendants of Genghis Khan was replaced by the Ming dynasty, which enacted isolationist policies. The effect of these political changes was to slow down trade along certain sections of the Silk Road. The area where merchants continued to thrive undisturbed was the empire founded by the Muslim Turk conqueror Emir Timur, known in the West as Tamerlane. His dominion extended from Xijiang to Syria, where he and his descendants ruled from 1370 to 1507. Timur rose from humble origins, a cattle rustler and mercenary and emperor. He has been described as the most successful bandit of all times, and yet this apparently opportunistic ruler had a grand strategic vision, seizing control of vital nodes of the Silk Road, which he executed perfectly. In July of 1402, Timur had defeated the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid at Ankara, modern-day Turkey. But he never pushed further westwards. 
That job was undertaken by the revived Ottomans, who seized Constantinople on the 29th of May 1453, putting an end to the Byzantine Empire. Western historiography sometimes marks this date as the end of the Silk Road. In fact, the Ottomans boycotted commerce with Western Europe and closed all the trade routes from Asia. Europeans still craved spices and silk, so they decided to find alternative ways to get their merchandise. This lack of supply stimulated the age of exploration and the colonization of the Americas. But this approach may be too simplistic. Sure, the Ottomans shut down the last leg of the east to west route, but the Silk Road did not cease to exist immediately. The exchange of goods, ideas, and talent continued between China and Central Asia for at least two centuries. Eventually, trade and activity would slow down, partially due to the encroaching of desertic areas which swallowed many of the settlements, oases, and trading posts along the land road. It was also partially due to the increasing isolationism of the Ming. But what really did it was the increasing competition from the Silk Road's maritime equivalent, the Silk Sea routes in the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. We've described the Ming as essentially isolationists, but this policy was not consistent, as during much of the 15th century, they encouraged maritime travel and exploration. At the time, much of Chinese naval trade took place in the Nanhai region, which encompassed Taiwan and the Philippines and the coastal provinces of southern China, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand. Sailors trading across the Nanhai ventured westwards, exporting silk, porcelain, and tea, returning with goods from India, Persia, Syria, Arabia, and North Africa. The most important part of the Nanhai Quanzhou became known as the terminus of the Silk Sea routes. This booming trade had been encouraged by the mission of Admiral Zheng He, who had seven diplomatic expeditions ranging from Borneo to East Africa. He commanded a fleet of 62 merchant and naval vessels manned by 30,000 sailors, a force that would have sent shivers down the spine of any port city. But Zheng He was not after conquest. His mission was to deepen Chinese knowledge of the outside world and establish solid trade relations with the countries he visited. Eventually, the age of the Silk Sea routes reached its end. From the 16th to the 19th century, European powers extended their reach into India and later into China. The global economy founded on colonization supplanted the need for extending trade routes, while the laying of railroads across the Eurasian landmass dealt the final blow to the ancient caravan tracks. The traditional Silk Road may be a memory of the past, but the basic concept, a functioning trans-Eurasian exchange link, is pretty much still alive. In 2015, the Chinese government released its Belt and Road Action Plan, a $900 billion investment in infrastructure which will facilitate trade corridors between China, Central Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. According to Peter Frankopan, professor of global history at Oxford University, the Silk Roads were networks that linked continents and oceans together, a vital pattern of exchange that is being replicated in our era. The Silk Roads were, and still are, the world's central nervous system, one which Europe and Asia cannot live without.